Hello, welcome to our session on service revolution on how to improve a service culture fast. And my favorite case study here is really Lux Resorts and Hotels. What is so spectacular about this case study is that Lux was virtually bankrupt after the financial crisis. And with a very low investment and no money and without firing anyone, Lux managed to turn around into really a fast growing company that even started to even continue to add growth and adding hotels, even during the COVID-19 crisis. So let me share with you some of the learnings from this. It's actually quite a well-documented case study. So we did the case study here in my textbook on, on Lux, which really writes up the whole story. And then we had a Harvard Business Review paper on this, which was, we submitted a 40 page paper to HBR and they published, I think two pages of it. So the other 38 pages we published in a white paper here. And then we had a webinar also on uh, Harvard Business Review on the same topic, because after our HBR paper was published, there was so much resonance that they asked us a year later, can you do a webinar, which is still available um, online? And I was lucky enough to have Paul Jones, the CEO who drove this re uh, re um, revolution. And uh, I had him as a guest speaker at NUS. And then whatever I, whenever I bring a very excellent guest speaker here, then I also make sure we take a few videos with this guest speaker. It was quite interesting because in our typical EMBA class, I schedule a guest speaker for 30 minutes uh, to, to present, 30 minutes Q&A. And when Paul Jones was here in the class, um, we should have finished at six, six o'clock and then go for dinner with him. We have dinner here with all the students and those who want to network can sit with him on the table to discuss. And the discussion was going on until 7 p.m. And you could hear a needle drop in the classroom because his service revolution story was so fascinating uh, that the class didn't want to end, right? So I stopped it here, we went for dinner. But we did the same with the videos. I wanted to do one video of three minutes. And for this, we did a 15 minute shot, but the video we shot in the end was like an hour. And we cut three videos, which by the way, are all available on, U on YouTube. So you can see here, I mean, it's quite a story on looking at a turnaround, a very fast revolution on how to improve service quality without much money and without much time and with the same team. Now, when, when we did the, wrote this paper for Harvard Business Review, they pushed us very hard. They said, look, you know, yes, we know our 40 page paper, we know all of this, but tell us stuff we don't know yet. So what is different? And Lux is only one of about 20 companies we worked with where we did a rapid transformation for them. So what did you learn from all of those transformations here? What's sort of unique and, and different and what would change how a CEO drives a turnaround in a service organization? And what we came up with are these four key learnings here. That is what I thought or what we thought and HBR thought was many of these uh, are misunderstood and run badly in organizations. And the first one is do not start a service revolution with customer facing employees. Instead involve everyone with a special focus on internal and shared services. And I mean, I've had many requests by organizations, please help us to improve service. Some of them were banks and I myself used to be a banker in my first career and have a guess who, which department or unit in those companies approached me. Yeah. And it usually was HR 
And usually HR wanted me to train their branch staff, their customer contact center staff. So it's all the customer facing staff. Me being a banker by myself, I, I, before I met them, I always had to look at their service. And what I usually found is that actually frontline staff is doing already a great job. What is problematic is very often products, policies, processes. And then I usually, because I looked at it, I gave the team that came to see me a few concrete examples where these products, processes, policies are wrong. And guess what? That was usually the end of the conversation because all they were interested is in training the front line. Whereas what I asked them to do was much bigger in scope um, to really go back to fix the root causes. And why focus on internal service providers? I mean, I work with so many service organizations, the problems the frontline faces usually do not originate from the frontline. Yes, these problems come from finance, from marketing, uh, from uh, um, uh, IT, yes, from everyone else who comes, who, who, is, who is sort of policies, processes, impact how the customer is being served. And I mean, one of the big uh, companies here in Singapore, I worked with them and, and they, they brought in a change agent, a lady who was in charge of all customer service in Singapore that included customer contact centers, service centers, retail shops, uh, deployment teams, service teams and all of this. And, um, she had a weekly meeting with the, other, with the other SVPs and the CEO and where she always presented the issues they were facing right now, where are the complaints about. And most of the time, the or, origin of those was from somewhere else in the organization. So that's why it is so important to focus, to make sure that all of these other parts of the organization are customer focused, customer centric, and in, uh, understand the, the um, um, uh, um, downside sort of implications of their decisions. So rule number one is start with everyone with a special focus on internal uh, people and processes and service uh, people. Uh, selling to the front line is like selling snow to the Eskimos here. Here the next is don't start by training people on specific service skills and scripts and procedures. Instead, educate them first to a better understanding of what service excellence truly means. So basic service skills is you train how to answer the phone, how to do a certain process and so on, what language to use. Whereas what what does, if you train what does service excellence means for your organization? This is, we define service excellence very often as you take action to create value for someone else. So it is active. You do something for your customer. And to get the big picture for Lux, that the vision, purpose, and values here. And uh, it was really about, we help people celebrate life, the mission. And the vision was we make every moment matter. So imagine if you get this into the hearts and the minds of every associate in, in, in this resort chain here, our job is to help people celebrate life. And why? They save the whole year to have this time together with their loved ones, to have this family holiday. And our job is here to make sure they connect, they have a good time, we help them to celebrate life. And to make every moment matter is also important. You're here on holiday, right? So whether you wait for the dive shop or for somewhere else, how do I make this time great for you? Yeah, Make every moment matter and help people celebrate life. 
Now, the third rule here is don't pilot change. Instead, go fast and go big to build momentum. Um, you can pilot individual ideas, concepts, services, but not a culture. You want to have a culture change? Don't allow people to fall back into the old rotten routine. It's like Caesar went to England. He burned the ships, the soldiers. You, you win or there's no back for you. Similar here, don't allow people to go back. So don't do change. And, the, and uh, don't, don't do, do pre-testing here. And the, the last ro rule here is, which I think many companies get wrong, don't focus on your traditional KPIs. I mean, this is your satisfaction, sales, market share, contribution, and all of this. Why you shouldn't focus on those? During a revolution, they all will tank. They will come down. Yes, so it will be very demotivating for your team. So what you want to focus on instead is, is sort of leading revolution indicators. So what you want during this revolution is people to create many new ideas and implement many of those ideas. So for during the service revolution, what Lux measured and, and sort of tracked was at your resort and within the resort, in your team, how many ideas did you have? And how many of those ideas that you implement okay so that's a very different it's a very idea implementation kind of view, view here to to drive um the service revolution so these are the four learnings we took which we thought many companies get wrong because what they do is they do teach frontline they do start with scripts and uh, skills and procedures uh, they do pilot here and they still keep their traditional KPIs. So don't do that. So these were the, the four learnings where we, which we thought many, many organizations get wrong. Now, let me look at the four thrusts. This, how, how do you... Okay. So this one just cut it out. <laughs> don't worry, I'll just continue. So let's look at the, how to get it right. So we discussed what is it companies shouldn't do and some of the key learnings, but how can you think about getting a revolution right? And it really starts with service leadership, values, vision, and purpose. So what Lux did, they, the entire top management team, all the resort general managers, and everyone came together for a two-day workshop on What's our vision? What's our purpose? What is our values? And this is where this every moment matters and we help people celebrate life came from, plus the values and they translated this in, into nice, very nice uh, uh, storyboards here. So that's the first thing. So the service leadership, then the next thing they did right after the training, the next day, all the general managers, all the division heads came back all to their own units uh, that was around the world service culture and training started with a ton of workshops where they really came together there was a half a day of workshop on customer expectations and and, and sort of to understand customers better but the rest was really on 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 uh, making things better so the idea was how do i get my staff to take personal responsibility to take action to create value and be part of an uplifting service culture. And these workshops then came together and, and thought, okay, let's create ideas. What can we do? And then after all of these ideas, they had uh, three very simple sort of um, assessment criteria for each of these ideas. And the first one was, can I do it now? meaning I could start implementing this or developing and implementing this idea now. The next one was, could I do it alone or do I need an Accenture for this or some other provider? So can I do it now? Can I do it alone? And the last one was, can I do it with no money or little money? <laughs> okay. And 
you can see where this is going about 50 to 60 percent of all ideas could be done now could be done alone and could be done without a lot of funding here and then the, the, the message was why don't we do it just go and implement right so you can see that culture and training and, and then doing things or taking action uh, really resulted in a lot of change and, and, doing, uh, and, and doing things. Here, one of my service heroes is Tony, the late Tony Sier, and he became famous as the CEO of Zappos. And he wrote a book, which I can really recommend to everyone, that's called Delivering Happiness. It's a very cute story about his own story as an entrepreneur so he had his first venture where he made a hundred million dollars as a young mid-20s almost wanted to retire but then of course you're way too bored so he had a loft a sports car and and tons of time so he then started zappos which was a uh, started with retailing shoes it's quite interesting right shoes sizes and taste and god knows what is not so easy to retail on 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 a, a e-commerce platform which he did but he pulled it off and uh, it's quite interesting the tough decisions he made i mean he was based in san francisco silicon valley and they're not known for customer service and at some point he made this really hard decision which cost him a lot of associates who didn't want to move but he said let's go somewhere in america where customer service is great and so i looked at where is the best customer service in the whole of, of the united states and don't laugh but he came up with las vegas yeah so he moved the whole company to vegas and they headquartered there until today and the whole company was sold to to amazon at, at over 1 billion us dollars so he almost lost everything you know, i mean there was the dot-com crisis and and god knows so he almost lost everything he made in his first venture but he pulled it through and made zappos, zappos successful and today they are very successful e-commerce part of, of Amazon. But there's one thing Tony said it, which I really love. This was part of the culture that everyone has to improve one thing every week. There has to be every week something you do better than you did last week. And if it is how you know how to operate Excel or, or how do you use Outlook or calendar or whatever. Yeah. The idea was if everyone in the whole organization has this growth and innovation and learning attitude. And however small, if it is sort of SOP to do one thing better this week than last week, can you imagine the cumulative improvement of the organization? Now, the third thrust is really innovation and differentiation. And I very much like this here because why? When you hear restructuring, uh, what do you think? And all you hear in the media is so many headcount cuts and so many, what it's always cutting, cutting, cutting. Now, how motivating is this for the people who are still in the organization? It's terrible, right? I mean, I've been a long-term suffering shareholder of Deutsche Bank. Yeah? There was one restructuring after another. So I wonder who are the people who are still in the bank? So thank God it's turning around now, right? But, uh, uh, Lux did, went the other way. Of course, they did cost cutting, but they didn't fire any of the associates. Um, they had a hard time. At, I mean, uh, Paul Jones during his lecture, he, he said, I, without my CFO, I, I, I wouldn't have known how to survive this. I couldn't sleep because I couldn't pay payroll. Yeah. So, I mean, you think about this here and and then he went into innovation and differentiation as a core strategy. And I mean, without mentioning any names, I've been teaching a case study for many years on an Asian resort chain. This resort chain was unbelievably innovative in the 1990s and early 2000. And after that, nothing happened. So I thought, well, maybe everything that's important in a resort chain has been invented and is there but whenever you think this stop yourself is not true there's always room for innovation and this is why i was so blown away by lux hotels and resorts because they got the whole company to innovate and think and came up with this what they call r2g's reasons to go to lux and 
until today, every resort, the teams think about what could we innovate? What could we do new? What is exciting for our guests? And the winning team in a resort then goes to Mauritius to present to the board. And the board then picks the winners of, of those ideas that have the best potential. They pilot them in a few resorts. And if successful, they get rolled out um, system-wide. And when you go into a luxe hotel, hotel and resort and you ask staff, they tell you with gleaming eyes about Cinema Paradiso, Cafe Lux, the Wishing Tree, and all the R2Gs they developed. Why? They were built in-house by the team. Uh, many of them, no team members who did them. So it's, it's an exciting story here. And just to show you some, this is Cinema Paradiso. So I can ask you, so what is so different between Cinema Paradiso and then let's say a beach movie screening in a five-star resort like a Marriott or yeah, any of these big chains? So what's the difference? They both show a movie on the beach. They have maybe music before and after they and so on. Now, the difference is that only Lux Hotels and Resorts has a branded experience. It's called Cinema Paradiso. They had a product development team sit down and think through exactly what this branded experience will be like. So all the features, all the processes. And then they come up with things like, oh, there's an afternoon or 6 p.m. show for children. There's an 8 p.m. show for adults. For the kids, we have ice cream and popcorn. For the adults, there's also a glass of wine. Uh, there are um, noise cancellation wireless headsets. So everyone has a great sound experience without disturbing others. Uh, during the day, uh, there are very simple voting mechanisms where guests can vote what movie they want to see. So they have two little glasses here with, with, uh, with the blue and red, for example, purse. And whichever movie you want, you put into this glass or into that glass. So it's, it's a bit of fun around how the movies are being selected. So that's Cinema Paradiso. So it is a properly developed experience. So somebody sat down and really designed what should this thing look like. And the other thing is then that this is rolled out um, system-wide. That means every staff know exactly what it is. Uh, it can be explained by every staff. There's language vocabulary for it. There's service standards for it. It can be shown on the website exactly what it is. And even customers have a language. So if you write something on TripAdvisor on Cinema Paradiso, it is going to be Lux, right? And, and you can talk about it. So that's Cinema Paradiso. Yeah, this is Cafe Lux. Actually, Paul Jones was already um, uh, retired when he was called back to become the CEO of Lux. And he, his passion was coffee. So he wanted to start his own coffee chain before joining Lux. So he didn't do it in, in, as an independent chain, but he started a Cafe Lux. And you can read the text here. They give it again, they, they call it Cafe Lux. It is, again, the whole thing is developed. They even developed what they call Island Blend, what they serve, which is a selection of organic, renowned coffee beans from three blends of Arabica, from 45% from Brazil, 10% from Ethiopia, 45% from Guatemala, right? So there's this whole uh, story behind the coffee. And when you look at the door here, at the cafe, this is where the coffee is roasted on site. And every afternoon, I think at four o'clock, you can go there and, 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 and have a look at the roasting. You can nibble on the different types of beans. They show you how the coffee is being roasted. You can smell it. You can see it. You can ask tons of questions. And afterwards, you go in front again into the Cafe Lux and you taste that coffee. And I mean, I hear a lot of stuff. I forget a lot of stuff. But you look at the clock there in Cafe Lux. It is at 4 p.m. So I still remember when it, they talked to us about it. Every Cafe Lux at every resort 
this clock is there and it's always 4 p.m. And why? It's quite cute because 4 p.m. is coffee time and coffee time is any time. Right? So you can see how, again, how they develop Cafe Lux. Yeah, this is the Beach Rouge. That is a club at the beach. And one of the team members of Cafe Lux went to the Bar Rouge, which is on a rooftop in Shanghai next to the Peace Hotel overlooking the Bund. So that's a, quite an exciting sort of uh, night spot uh, with nice cocktails and drinks and so on and so forth. So they loved it so much that they said, let's develop an exciting club for Lux hotels and resorts which turned out to be then the Beach Rouge and is quite exciting. And as you can see, and at night is quite nice. They have these, at least in, in, in uh, Maldives, they have these jetties out into the sea. They are white and illuminated from the bottom. And there are all these islands on this jetty coming out where people can dance. And the sound system is the furthest out on this jetty. And it's kind of nice. You can hear the sound traveling on the sea and you can dance on these islands. And if, you, if you're tipsy and you fall off the island, there's a fishing net around every one of these islands and you can lie in this island and look up into the sky and see the moon and the stars and enjoy the music, right? So it's again, a fully developed concept with a brand name and an innovation. And what, what really wowed me was that Lux was dying and rather than going the cost cutting route, they cut costs, but the entire conversation internally was about innovation and differentiation. And that is the case until today. They really, really are one of the most innovative resort chains I know. So these are the four thrusts here. Um, the last one is measurement, incentives, and feedback. So we said during the revolution, you focus on what? Ideas generated ideas implemented. After the revolution is over, maybe six to 12 months after you started this, you go back to your standard uh, um, measures. So you look at, at uh, key measures as what? Um, EBITDA, profitability is one of the key measures here. And Paul Jones was very, very adamant on, on um, the measurement and incentives here. And he said, you have to achieve two hurdle rates. If you don't achieve them, there's no bonus, no incentive for you. <coughs> and these hurdle rates are number one, customer satisfaction, guest experience. So are guests happy with, with what this resort is doing? If they're not happy, you don't have a sound basis for the future. So there's a minimum hurdle rate for guest satisfaction. And the second one is staff engagement. If your team is not happy, how are you gonna sustain anything you're doing, right? So guest satisfaction, guest experience and, and staff engagement you achieve a hurdle rate. And once you achieve a hurdle rate, there's sort of an increasing um, bonus payment that is linked to EBITDA, to the profitability of this resort that goes up as guest experience and staff engagement, team engagement is increasing. Yeah. And Paul Jones, he really used TripAdvisor to also track what's happening. So every evening yeah, before he goes to bed, he was looking at every resort's TripAdvisor's posts. And if there was a bad post, the general manager already was expecting his call. And the, by that time, most likely they already would have addressed that issue. And the result was that Lux was nowhere on TripAdvisor. I think today you can look online the Lux hotels and resorts are usually number one, number two, number three, even in highly competitive markets like Maldives and Mauritius. So they really moved up thanks to this here. And the measurement, again, uh, they have robust external systems that are completely out of the control of the resort for measuring the guest experience is done centrally and the same for, for team engagement. Okay, so these are the four thrusts here on how to get it right. So let me close here on, on the Lux story. So again, think, what, 
what did you learn from here? What are some key takeaways from Lux? Um, what are the key success factors in this Lux service revolution? What did they do, what did they do right? And also what could have gone wrong? And importantly, what can you learn from Lux for your own organization? What ideas could you implement?